This year we are celebrating our 10th anniversary at Kingdom Builders. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I can remember uh, our first service. We were all excited. We planned it for about four and a half months and we launched it and we got through and it was great. Man, people got saved. It was just a fun time. And afterwards we were all happy and excited. We were having lunch and we looked at each other and said, oh my goodness, we got to do this again next week. Uh, a lot's changed. Um, my hair on my chin was a little darker back then, praise the Lord. So I thank y'all for that. But we have, uh, we've experienced 10 wonderful years of ministry. Um, so in order to, uh, to, to really celebrate what God has done, and that's really what we want to do. How many of you realize that it's important that you celebrate? Yeah. Celebration of, uh, of, of, a, of the end of one season becomes the fuel for your next season. And a lot of times what we fail to celebrate will exit our lives. So if you, if, you, if you don't celebrate the good things that God has done, then chances are you probably won't experience things like that because you don't really celebrate uh, the victories that you've experienced. We are going to celebrate in the month of October. And I want to give you just a, an announcement today that ought to really fire you up because one of the things that we're going to do to celebrate is we have someone who is special to this ministry who will be here. Oh, that's all. That's, your, that's the announcement. That's it. Praise the Lord. Are y'all ready for some word? October 13th, a Thursday night. You think y'all to just wait? They, they really don't act like they want to know, do they? Next week. Y'all want me to wait till next week? Help me, Holy Ghost. Okay. On October 13th of this year, a Thursday night, we're excited to announce that our very own Apostle Ron Carpenter Jr. will be at KB. So we are going to be having a Thursday night celebration. He will be with us. Uh, you'll get a lot of details about that. But Apostle Ron, uh, his team will be with us on that Thursday evening uh, to commemorate what God has done over 10 years. They are, it's just a special year because uh, the, week ne the week after that, they are at Redemption celebrating their 25th year of, uh, of ministry. So it's just a special time and we're going to all celebrate together. And uh, So mark your calendars. Um, uh, don't worry, we're going to be making lots of plans. There'll be lots of things that will be, be shared with you over the next couple of weeks as we prepare for that. But does that excite anybody that Apostle Ron's going to be in the house? Amen. All right, are you ready for some word? Yeah. I want to dive right into this thing. We had a good time last week. Let me just ask one question. Are there any they's in the house this week? And, and, and if you, maybe you weren't here last week, but uh, just ask your neighbor, say, are you a they or a them? Now turn to the other neighbor and say, neighbor, are you a they or are you a them? Now just turn around, somebody sitting in your seat next to you, and just say, say you're my third choice, but... I have a question for you. Are you a they or are you a them? This morning, I want to hit on something. Um, I want, I don't, not going to really, I don't think it'll take too much time, but I want to share with you um, something the Lord's placed in my heart. And it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's two passages of scripture that you will be very familiar with, but that God, for me, kind of connected the dots on um, lately. And, and I, want to, I want to talk to you about it. And then you'll be able to see exactly how this falls, if you, you could take this blueprint that we see in the Bible and lay it right on top of your life and I think you'll be able to see the correlation between something that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, faced in his earthly ministry and that we face today, amen? So if you got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me quickly to the third chapter of Matthew. The third chapter of Matthew. I want to read about four verses from here and then I'm going to read a few from Matthew 4, and then we will uh, jump right into this thing, both feet at the same time. Praise the Lord. If you got it, say amen. If you are near Genesis, you need to change where you are looking. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3. If you got it, say amen. I'll tell you what, if you got it, how about stand to your feet? Let's do that. Matthew 3, guys in the back, I'm going to read verses 13 through 16. You ready? Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So then he allowed him. 
When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Now flip over real quick to, to chapter 4. I want to read just a few verses here. I'm going to start with verse 1. And it says this, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Does somebody say, duh. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him up on the pinnacle of the temple and said, you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, it is written again. Somebody say again. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. So again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all, everybody say all, all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will just fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Before you find your seat, I want you to just delight me for just a second. I want you to high five three people sitting in your area and I want you to tell them this. From dunking to ducking. Come on, tell them. From dunking to ducking. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you have, if you're in here today and you have been in church for a good portion of your life, then chances are you are most likely familiar with both of these passages of Scripture. The first passage, of course, is the narration that has been given to us concerning the baptism of Jesus that was performed by John the Baptist. You do realize that's where John got his name. It's not because he went to the Southern Baptist Church. John the baptizer, and he baptized Jesus here in the River Jordan. And I want to set up for just a few minutes here in this passage, then we'll transition, we'll tie the two together, then we'll shout and go to the house, amen. But I, but I, want, to, I want to make sure that we camp out here because there are a few things about Jesus' life that, that are, are, are of utmost significance. Now, I know all of, his, all of his life matters. There's nothing insignificant in the Bible, but there are a few things that we see in the, in the journey of Jesus on the earth that it's important that we note and, and, and really make a special note of. And, that, and, and I think one of the reasons that we can say this concerning the baptism of Jesus is because it's, the only, it's one of the only things in Jesus' ministry that all four Gospels talk about. You realize that? Now, I know, how many of you um, have ever heard anything about the birth of Jesus? Right? Uh, and, okay, let me just rephrase that. How many of you have ever heard of Christmas? Right? You know, we, we can acknowledge the importance of Christmas, the birth, the, 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 the holiday that we celebrate, the birth of Jesus, uh, of Jesus Christ. But how many of you realize that the birth of Jesus actually only shows up in two of the Gospels? But we sure do stop. We take off work. We, we spend money we don't have on presents. We hang out with family that we don't necessarily like, but we tolerate for a couple of days. I'm not talking. If you're sitting with your family, don't amen right there. Praise the Lord. Just say, I just pray for them people. Hallelujah. But we, I think it's easy to say that we, we certainly we, we, we give honor and honors due concerning the birth of Jesus. But we don't often talk a lot about the baptism of Jesus. But I want, us, I want us to look at the significance of it because there's some things that take place here that are, are to, 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 for, for lack of a better term, earth shattering. Okay? There are things that we see that occur in this passage of Scripture that are key in the foundation of our understanding of the ministry of Jesus Christ. So let's look for just a few moments at the baptism of Jesus. Jesus shows up on the scene. There's this messenger that's already in place named John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had already baptized a few folks. 
But Jesus shows up and he goes up to John the Baptist and he tells him, I need you to baptize me. Can you imagine for a moment, Jesus, I mean, can, you just, can we just imagine, for just, if Jesus walks up to you and says, hey, I need you to baptize me. I mean, think about it. What if Jesus walked up to you and said, hey, I have a headache. Will you pray for healing for me? Or if Jesus said, I gotta, I've got this thing going on tonight in Galilee. I need you. Would you mind preaching for me? Think about the ground. Jesus has come to John and said, I, my ministry needs your ministry. And he speaks to John and he says, I need you to baptize me. And John does and says what any Christian in their right mind would say. He says, man, I, no, I'm good. You, you, you Jesus all by yourself. You don't need me. He says, I'm not. And Jesus, then Jesus just says, stop with your false humility and respond in obedience to my request. You're going to baptize me. And John says, okay. Because when Jesus tells you to do something, you do it. Can I just tell you this? There, most of the things that Jesus is gonna ask of you won't make sense to you. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, if, I wanna, if we just wanna be real with us, John was ordained by God to do this, but if John would have refused to baptize Jesus, Jesus would have been baptized. Because Jesus didn't need John. He's just allowing John to be a part of the process. Uh, Newsflash for some of you who, uh, I know you glow in the dark, praise the Lord for you because you're holy. But Jesus doesn't need you. He just allows you to participate in the story. <laughs> Don't look at them. Y'all know they're in here. Don't look at them. <laughs> I can see them. They may already frowning at me, praise the Lord. John responds and says, okay, I'll baptize you. So John, they go into the River Jordan and, and he takes Jesus and he, he dips him in the water and he brings him back up. And John had baptized a few folks before this takes place. Jesus was not his first victim. But he becomes the, the object of the affection of heaven in a moment's notice because the moment the Bible says that he comes up out of the water, it says the earth opened up. The skies... The, the separation between heaven and earth was removed. And it says the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, came down from heaven and descended upon him like a dove. I mean, when doves cry, right there, baby. Baptizes him first in water, but then in spirit. And then he hears this sound Echoing from the heavens. This is my beloved son, 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 son. And whom I'm well pleased, please, please, please. God affirms Jesus, the son, right here. Now, just in case you're wondering if this really is that significant, can I just tell you this? It's the only time in scripture that we see all three of the Trinity together at one place. Oh, yeah, you ain't thought about that, have you? Because we have Jesus the Son being baptized. We have God the Father speaking about the Holy Spirit descending upon him. Like the Trinity in its fullness is right here in this one. Can I just tell you this? When all three show up to the party, that means it's a pretty big deal. Jesus gets baptized. The reason this is so important is because, one, it is the first public announcement to the world that he truly is the Son of God. There have been some conversations that have taken place. Mary, you're going to give birth to the Son of God. Joseph, you're going to be the baby daddy. All right? Telling the shepherds the, the Savior of the world has been born. But this was a public announcement of who Jesus was. And it let everybody around know that Jesus was the Christ. Jesus was the Son of God. Okay? In other words, God didn't send an email. God said it, and the whole world heard it. Like if you were to be in... Now, I know Wallace, North Carolina was not established when the sky opened up and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. But if it would have been and you'd have been at work that day, you would have heard this voice echoing out through all of eternity saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And you'd have been like, what was that noise? And she, I, Edna, I don't know, baby. I don't know what that is. But I mean, there's something important going on. God made a statement that the entire world knew. And it wasn't just the humans that heard it. For 30 years, the enemy had been searching throughout mankind trying to figure out 
who the Savior was. Listen, the enemy had known since the Garden of Eden that there was a Savior coming. Then he got a prophetic word and found out that it was time for him to arrive on the scene. So the enemy does as he always does. He tried to use abortion to take out Jesus. So I need you to hear something right now. Every move of God is preceded by an attempt of the enemy to abort the mission. When God was going to bring forth Moses to deliver his people, the Bible says that the enemy, Pharaoh, he sent out a, 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 an edict across all the land that all of the babies would be murdered. That's why Moses ended up in a basket floating down the river. When God declared that it was time for the Son of Man to be born into the earth, Herod decided, hey, I want all the two-year-olds two and under to be wiped out. All the boys, because I'm trying, the enemy is trying his best to abort the mission of the Christ. It's not a coincidence that abortion is such a hot topic now. Can I just be honest with you? And, and, and wherever you stand, abortion is, is what the enemy uses to try to stop the mission before it ever starts. We see this take place. The enemy is searching throughout the land for 30 years. And all of a sudden, the enemy hears this voice. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So now the enemy is put on notice. And he says, oh, that's the guy. I'm sure he's sitting around with all the demons saying, that's the guy. That's the guy. Y'all don't know where y'all been. He's been there the whole time. He's a carpenter's boy. He don't look like much, but that's the guy. Jesus is affirmed by his father. And you know what I love? I love the fact that the sky opened up and the, and the, and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. And the reason I, I say this is because if you remember correct, anybody want to guess where the first time in Scripture that the heavens opened up was? I'll give you a hint. It's in Genesis 7. Y'all know what happened in Genesis 7? It rained a little bit. The Bible says Noah after for 600 years and that, you know, Noah had been, it says now it's time for the, for the rains to come. And it says that water began to sprout up from the ground and it says the heavens opened and it began to rain for the flood. So the first time that we see heaven open up is when the, the rain comes. Now, after 40 days and 40 nights of Noah chilling with his family and all these animals in this boat, the Bible says that they, they, when, they, when, they, when the rain stopped, Noah sent out a bird. He sent out a raven. The raven didn't come back. You know why? Because the raven feeds off other dead animals. Raven represents the enemy. And the Bible says that when he let the raven go, the raven began to, to, to go across the land to and fro. You know what the Bible says about the devil? He's roared like a, like a roaring lion going to and fro across the thing. That's what the raven represents. But then it says Noah released a dove. He released a dove. The dove came back with nothing. So he woke up the next day, released the dove again. Uh, seven days later, the dove came back and has an olive branch in his mouth. Noah sends him off again and it says the dove never returned. The purpose of sending the dove out was so Noah could fi figure out if, their land, if the water had receded enough for there to be land worthy for the, Holy Spirit, for the, for the dove to land on. We don't hear anything else about a dove all throughout the Old Testament. Fast forward to the River Jordan. Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist. It says the heavens opened up and a dove comes down. And the dove, when Noah sent it out, was looking for some earth to land on that was worthy. Newsflash, you and I, and even Jesus in his flesh, our flesh was made of the dust of the earth. So the whole, the, literally the dove was hovering around looking for some, some um, earth that was worthy to land on and then Jesus shows up and God said, that's him, that's the one, that's the place. Dove, descend, Holy Spirit, have your way. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit descends upon him and baptizes him. He is no longer Jesus from Nazareth. He is now Jesus the Christ. I need you to catch this. When you said yes to Jesus, at the time that was appointed by God in heaven for you to engage him in relationship, the Holy Spirit came into your life. From heaven, heaven opened up when you said yes to Jesus. God declared, this is my beloved child in whom I'm well pleased. And the Holy Spirit filled you just like it filled Jesus. In that moment, 
you were affirmed. In that moment, your identity was established by God. Are you with me? That was an important moment when that happened. The problem, though, for most of us is we think that's where the story ends. Sky opens up. This is my beloved child in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit comes on, and we're going to dance with Jesus until the end of eternity. Because that's what happened, right? Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove, like we read, right? And then it's what it said. Jesus just partied and did great things for the next three years. Smooth sailing. Ain't that what the Bible says? No. Nah. It says immediately. So I need you to catch this. And your Bible wasn't written in verses and chapters. And the problem is, and it's good that we have those, I thank God for it, because it's, it makes it much easier to find things. But I'll be honest with you, sometimes what happens is when we read it in verses and in chapters, we see things get taken out of context and encapsulated within the chapter that it's written. Whereas if you really read it like it happened, you'll notice, and if you, in fact, if you don't believe me, go to the book of Mark. You can go to the book of Mark. I think it's the first chapter of the book of Mark when it talks about this because it doesn't break it down in things. It says he got baptized, and it says immediately he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The problem is we want to stop at the baptism. But there's a next, just tap your neighbor and say there's a next step. I'm gonna help you out right here because most of us are frustrated not because of what happened at the baptism, but what happens in the wilderness. And it's important to manage the wilderness. How you handle the wilderness determines how long you stay there. He was baptized in water, and he was led to the wilderness. He was baptized in water. Everybody say water. And he was led into the wilderness. Everybody say wilderness. From the water to the wilderness. From the water to the wilderness. Say it with me. Say it with me. From the water to the wilderness. Immediately, the Spirit led him to the wilderness. When you got saved, you got affirmed. But that's not the end of your journey. It's the beginning. Jesus didn't go from the River Jordan to the upper room. That's what, that's what we want to do, right? We want to go from the river. We want to go from the baptism. Go on and elevate me, Jesus. I'm ready. See, the, the baptism, Brother John, represents your intimate place with God. And it's not just when you get saved. Okay, it represents your time with God. When you get in, when you're going in the water, when you're in the water with Jesus, even uh, let me just give you an example. When you come in here on Sunday mornings, this is your water. This is about you're in here. It's a safe place. It's a place where you get reaffirmed. It's a place where a crazy man with a microphone tells you and reminds you over and over again that you're a child of God, that you're not who you're, what your struggle is, that you're not what you came from, that you're not a product of your environment, but you're a child of God. And you get affirmed and you get reaffirmed and you get reaffirmed and the Holy Spirit's ministering to you and we sing songs that say, I don't know, you tell, tell us that you're a child of God, that he's our father, he's a good, good father. And we get affirmed in our identity. But you don't stay here until next Sunday. The Spirit, after you get affirmed and you've been in the presence, escorts you out those doors and guess what's waiting for you? The wilderness. And we get mad and frustrated because the wilderness doesn't look like the water. You ain't gonna help me today, but that's all right. I don't know what's wrong with y'all today. But we get upset because we don't walk into work and experience the same atmosphere as when we walk into church. And we think when we experience that, that we've missed God. Do you know how I many people I talk to say, well, I just, I just want to serve God. I just, I think I'm being called into ministry. Because they think this is ministry. They think that if you work for the church, that, you know, when you wake up on Monday morning and you come in here, that we just cut on the praise and worship and we high five and we tell them God loves them and you love them. And we had this idea because that's the atmosphere that's in the water. But that's not the same atmosphere that's in the wilderness. And if you don't discern the season you're in or the location where you are, then you'll be frustrated because your expectation won't be met by your experience. 
But it's important that we go into the wilderness. Let me just talk to you for just a second because here's what I need you to catch. Wouldn't it be nice if the order in which God lays this thing out were different? Because we go into, we have our water experience. We get dumped in the presence. Oh, it was so good. I just, I could have gone to glory on Sunday. Praise Jesus. The presence was so thick. It was just wonderful. We have our dunking experience, our immersion. And then we end up in the playing field with the enemy. The Bible says resist the enemy and he'll flee. That means you got, that don't mean you got to fight him. We always want to beat up the devil. You ain't got to beat the devil. Jesus beat the devil. All you got to do is resist the temptations of the devil. If you resist it, he'll leave you alone, at least for a season, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But resist, so resist means when the enemy swings, all you got to do is duck. You know what Paul, Paul says? Paul says, I put on the whole armor of God. I strap on my helmet, my breastplate, my feet. My, I, I get everything ready to go. I got my sword in my hand, my shield of faith. Everything's good. And I do all that so I can stand. It doesn't say so I can go out and I can fight the devil. Some of y'all wearing yourself out sword fighting, doing something God never called you to do. He says stand. And you'll be able to stand against the fiery darts of the enemy. So when he, you know what I mean? That doesn't just mean you just stand there and get hit. That means sometimes you'll be ducking a little bit. Well, what, Brother Warren, you the boxing man. You know why everybody hates Floyd Mayweather? Because they can't hit him. And people say, well, he's scared. He just runs around the ring. That man ain't lost. You know why he hadn't lost? Because he hadn't been hit. Right? Sometimes you just got to duck. But you got to dunk before you can duck. And let me tell you why. Because it would be nice. Let's just, I'll tell you what. Let's just think hypothetically for a moment. What if we could have the wilderness first and then the water? Like, What if we were led into the wilderness and the enemy came to you and he said, if you are a child of God, then, and all of a sudden, the heavens opened up. And you heard a voice, this is my beloved child, interrupting this regular scheduled broadcast. And whom I'm well pleased. And shut the devil up. Now, devil, go sit your behind down. We're done with you. Now, we're going to baptize you and everything's good. That would be nice if that's the way it played out. That's not how it works. See, the water always leads to the wilderness. The water leads to, the, the two are always going to be connected. I need you to hear this. The two are always going to be connected. In fact, even John the Baptist, who baptized in water, it said he was a voice in the wilderness. Wilderness and the water. But there's a, there's, there's a way God set this thing up. And I think, I think maybe one of the, 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 the perfect depictions of this is childbirth. Think about this. A right, baby gets conceived in the womb. In the womb, the identity is given. So when you find out if it's a boy or a girl, right? In the womb, what's the baby surrounded by? Water. And then one day, when everybody's eating at the dinner table, mama says, uh-oh. And we look at mama and say, mama, what's wrong? And mama says, my water broke. And it's time to have the baby. So we go to the hospital. They put mama in that Jaws of life machine with her legs, ankles strapped down. Bring in every available staff and nurse in the hospital to come in to see mama in all of her glory. And it comes time to push. And mama pushes. And the baby comes out, right? Water broke, baby came out. Everything's good. Do you remember how you came into the world? Do you know how a baby comes into the world? Babies don't enter into the world laughing. Babies don't enter into the world talking. Hey, y'all, how y'all doing? <laughs> Whoo, show sure was hot up in there. Glad to get out. <laughs> Babies don't enter into this world singing. We lift our hands and... No. Babies don't enter into the world rapping. Started in the belly, now I'm here. Babies don't enter into this world dancing. Do you know how a baby enters into the world? Crying. Baby looks up. Ah! Everybody in the family is going, they, they're so cute. Welcome to the world. Welcome to your family. And the baby's going, ah! ah! And I believe if we 
we had the gift of interpretation for babies crying, I believe this is what we'd say. Ah, what is this wilderness I've entered into? We'll start with the water. And, go to the and you, know, you know what I have learned, though? Can I be honest with you? Pastor Lewis and I have talked about this. One thing that I've learned in ministry is, uh, is to be slow to judge others. Because you don't know what wilderness they were born into. You got to go from the water to the wilderness. You got to start at one place. You get, now, now, why would God set it up like that? The reason God sets it up like that is because it'd be easy for you if it started with the wilderness and then the water. Because then once you get that behind you, like it's smooth sailing. But he says, you know what? I, I've, I've, I've raised you up for a purpose. I've sent you into the earth for such a time as this. I, I've, I'm calling you to a great thing that I'm going to establish in you and through you. And it's going to be you occupying the victory that I gave at the cross of Calvary. But I need you to go into the wilderness to take territory. I need you to go into the places where other folks can't go because it's in the wilderness where you establish your authority. See, Jesus established his authority. His identity was established in the water, but his authority was established in the wilderness because that's when he showed the devil who was in charge. And God said, I need you to do the same thing, but you gotta go through the water first because in the, it's in the water that you find out who you are. And so when you get in the wilderness, what you're going to remember is what you were just told in the water. See, when you get to work on Monday, what needs to be in your ears is what you heard on Sunday. This is my beloved child in whom I'm well pleased. And now I'm prepared for the wilderness because I went through the water. I can duck because I got dunked. And so it empowers us for the wilderness experience. The problem for most of us is we allow the heat what mom say? If you can't take the heat, get on up out the kitchen. The problem is we allow the heat from the wilderness to evaporate the residue of the water. And we get in the wilderness and we forget about the water. Because we're so, we're so overwhelmed by the wilderness experience that all we can think of is how can I get out of this? The enemy knows what he's doing. The enemy was waiting for Jesus. When he saw the Spirit lead him in there, he went on up in there, in there but he waited. Because he said, you know what, Jesus, Jesus is going to fast for 40 days. And after about 20, everybody, yeah, Jesus is doing it. Come on, Jesus. Jesus is feeling good. He's, he's having this conversation with the Father. He's, he's saying no to his flesh. He's in the midst of this thing. But I bet on, on day 30, Whew. Boy, I sure would like a hamburger by right now. 35, 36, 37. Finally, at the end of 40, it says, then the enemy came to him and tempted him. I need you to catch this. This is going to help you out right here because this is what the wilderness looks like for you. The enemy asked him three things. All three things were asked to Jesus to remove him from his identity. The enemy never attacked Jesus until his identity was affirmed. See, this idea that you thought when you got saved, that's when the enemy was going to leave you alone? Wrong. Oh, but that's not, very, that's not very uplifting, Pastor. Yes, it is, because I'm about to tell you how to win. The enemy comes to him after 40 days and says, if you are the son of God. See, he questions his identity, but listen how he does it. He, he, he's questioning his identity, but he's tempting him with something else. He says, if you are the son of God, then turn this stone into bread. You gotta be hungry. Just go ahead, just see that rock over there turn into some cornbread. Cornbread. That's what I believe it was. I don't believe it was unleavened holy bread from the temple. I believe it was some good old pie butter dripping off of it. That's the RIV, the Redneck International Version anyway. You got some cornbread. Looking at it, Sam. You know, like, like what my man said, you gonna eat that cornbread? He said, turn that stone into cornbread. And what, how does Jesus respond? He says, it is written. Man shall not live on bread alone. 
by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. Then he says, Jesus, Satan says, okay. So the first thing he tempted him with was what he needed. I need you to hear this because the enemy loves to tempt you with something that you think you need. I can't get no amens up in this house. The enemy wants to tempt you first with something that you need. Oh, you, need, you really need it. You hadn't, you hadn't eaten in 40 days? Here's a piece of bread. Oh, you ain't had a date in three years? Here, fetch. Here's your Boaz. That ain't Boaz. That ain't, that ain't look like, you know that ain't Boaz. But you ain't had a date in three years. Go ahead, you need, you need relationship, go ahead. The enemy will tempt you with something that you think you need. Then what's the enemy say? He says, he says, he took him up and he said, oh, okay. He said, I tell you what, throw yourself off this cliff. Because the Bible says, I need you to catch, the enemy knows scripture. The enemy will test you with the word of God. So you can take anything in the word of God and make it be something else if you take it out of context. And then, right, Brother John, that's what we teach in class. If you take the text out of the context, you're left with a con. And he says, hey, throw yourself off the mountain. He says, Lord, have mercy. Praise the Lord, we're about to get up out of here. He says, throw yourself off the mountain. Surely the angels will catch you, for they've been given charge over you, lest you dash your foot upon a stone. What's Jesus say? It is written, do not tempt the Lord thy God. It is written. He didn't say, well, I think, I'm pretty sure, I don't need, he said, it is written. And then finally the enemy says, all right, he takes him up on top of the mountain. He says, look at all these kingdoms. So he, oh, he tempts him with what he needs. And then he turns around and tempts him with what he has. He says, I know you got angels in charge of you. So just throw yourself off. Okay, yeah. So the enemy will tempt you with what you have. You've got that gift. You know you, know, you, you know you can do whatever you want to. You got that gift. God gave it to you. God gave Jesus the angels. Satan's not tempting him with demons. He's tempting him with angels. He'll tempt you with what you have. And then he takes them up and says, look, see all these kingdoms, they can all be yours if you just worship me. Now, now, he's, now he's, he's giving Jesus a shortcut to his destiny. Why did Jesus come to the earth? To reestablish the kingdom of God over all the earth, right? That's what Isaiah 9, 6 says. He came with a government upon his shoulders. Enemy's saying, oh, I'll give you a short. You know, there's this, you got, uh, the enemy's saying, listen, you're gonna have a rough road to hold. I'll mean, give you a short. If you'll just fall down, there ain't nobody around here, just me and you. If you'll just worship me, then I'll go ahead and give you. You ain't got to go through. You can just, you know, you can just be Jesus and you can be the ruler of all these things. And you don't have to worry about anything else. The enemy will tempt you with your own destiny. Can, can I just say, God is not a God of shortcuts. We, you know what? We think favor, we think favor equals shortcuts. I am preaching and you ain't saying nothing cause it hurt. We think favor is a shortcut. We think, you, we, it's amazing what we think. Favor. favor doesn't always bring you into easy. Favor just takes the, the pressure off you to perform cause it ain't about you to begin with. Favor will put you in places you can't ever work for yourself. But we think favor just gives us a shortcut. Favor is not a shortcut. We, we, we don't even, we do, if we could just understand favor, it would help us with a sign. We think favors when you go to Walmart and the person who's parked in the closest position to the building pulls out right before you pull in. Well, thank God for favor. I'm fair. Favor ain't fair. I'm parked up next to. Favor, favor has a purpose and it's to open up doors that you can't open yourself. But it's not to take you out of the process and just thrust you into the promise. God knows that ain't gonna work because when you get there and you don't go through the process, you're gonna ruin the promise. He, he, he offers him up. He says, hey, just worship me. He's already gone after what he needs and he's already, already gone after what he has. Now he says, now I'm going after who? I'm going after the who. Whose are you? If you'll just worship me, I'll make all this happen quickly. That's what the enemy does. Jesus responded all three times with it is written, it is written, it is written. You have to combat 
the temptation of the enemy with the word. There's three things you got to have. Write this down if you're taking notes. We're getting ready to shout and get out of here. I'm going to give you something to shout about in just a second. The first thing you need to know is he tempts you with what you need. You need to know what you already have. What you need is your intimacy with God. Do you know why? Je I know you think that Jesus was not really tempted by the enemy because he's Jesus. Well, he's, Je he's the son of God. They couldn't, the devil couldn't really tempt him. No, no, he said he was tempted in all things as you and I are tempted. That we may not have, that's what Hebrews says, that we may not have a high priest that we cannot, that cannot sympathize with us. So Jesus was tempted. But he understood what he needed. What he needed was his time with the Father. Time with the Father will prepare you for the temptation. The reason Jesus could easily say no, it is written, is because he had spent 40 days and 40 nights with his Father. If you aren't waking up in the morning, I'm going to get all up in your kitchen right here now. I'm going to go ahead and let you know. If you're, not getting, if you're not spending some time with God, then you're not going to be prepared for the temptation in the wilderness. I'm not saying you got to set your clock and make an hour. I'm not saying turn it into some religious ritual. But if you aren't having communion with God, common union with God, then you're not going to be prepared when the temptation comes in the wilderness. Well, Pastor, I don't know why I keep messing up. Well, how much time are you talking to God? Well, every Sunday. Well, that's good. If the devil only tempted you on Sundays, you'd probably be all right. But we think, but you, listen, this is good. Don't measure your level of preparation according to how you feel in the water. Because you feel holy up in here on Sunday morning. You're at the altar with your eyes closed and your hands lifted and you, and you just feel the presence of God. And, and sometimes that gives us a false sense of preparation. Like, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready. I don't know who you're talking about. I've been saved for 39 and a half years. I couldn't be tempted by the, by the devil. You are a prime candidate. That's called self-righteousness. That will put you, that will compromise your position quicker than anything. You got to spend time with the Father. Number two, so it's, it's what you need. That's what you need and what you have. You know what you got? You got the word of God. You got the word. What did Jesus respond with? The word. What did Jesus respond? Well, I don't really know how to respond to temptation. That's why, get some word up in you. Jesus said, it is written. I need you to catch this, all right? Because I know, and, I, and I'm guilty, I'm guilty. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not preaching at you, I'm preaching to us. But that smartphone that is so smart that it makes us dumb, that smart, that is not the source of your strength in the wilderness. You better have some word up in you because Jesus didn't say it was posted. He didn't say it is tweeted. He didn't say it is said. He said it is written. And if you aren't in the word of God, then you, there's a reason why you're struggling in the wilderness. I mean, you, it, is, it is imperative that we get in the word. The last thing is you got to remember whose you are. You know, why, you know why he really tempted Jesus with the kingdoms? It's because he realized that Jesus, if he's the son of the king, then his inheritance is the kingdoms. So he's saying, if I can change, I'm gonna shift your identity by changing whose you are. Because can I tell you this? Whatever you worship, that's who your daddy is. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, it hurt, it's the truth. Whatever you worship, that becomes... That becomes what your Lord is. Because you think about it. If you start worshiping materialistic things, do you know what happens? Every thought you have is connected to what you're trying to obtain or buy. Do you know what that means? That means it has become your Lord. As, as it has. Becomes your, whatever I worship, okay, whatever I submit myself to, that's what becomes my father. That's what becomes my Lord. And that, so, so you've got to remember the conversation in the water. Are you with me? But you've got to go through the water so you're prepared in the wilderness. All right. Y'all ready to finish? Y'all ready to go home? Y'all act like it. Y'all ready? I'm ready. I'm ready to eat. 
the Israelites. Because you look at Jesus and you go, oh, Jesus, that was so perfect. It was written, it was written, it is written. He handled this thing nice, but I ain't Jesus. And I would say, you are correct. You're not Jesus. But let me give you an example of something that didn't play out real well. Real quick. The Israelites were in bondage in Egypt. God called the Israelites to go where? To the promised land. I prepared for you a place, correct? Called Canaan. Moses is leading the Israelites out of bondage. God has spoken. These are my beloved children. I'm going to deliver them. They're Moses and the Israelites are marching out of Egypt when Pharaoh changes his mind. They get to the Red Sea. In case you were wondering, the Red Sea consists of water. They get to the water. Jesus parts it. They go through the water and guess where they end up? In the wilderness. They get to the wilderness and they think, listen, can you imagine the celebration when that wall of water collapsed on Pharaoh? You know, they're all going, man, we told you. That's what you get. 400 years. Yeah, baby. <laughs> they were probably fired up, excited. They get out, they high five, and man, that was good. Moses. <laughs> Bro, we out here. We did it. We out. Woo, I tell you what, I don't word up appetite. Moses was on the menu. And after stirring around for a little bit, they were 11 days from their destiny. 11 days. That's how long it would have taken for them to get from the rest into Canaan. 11 days. But they stopped in the wilderness. Jesus was there 40 days. They were there 40 years. They went through the water to get to the wilderness. The problem is when they got in the wilderness, you know what they said? Oh, you brought us out here to die. I will, can we just turn around and go back? Can you do that, that thing you did again with the water and we cross on back over? At least we had three hots and a cot. They forgot that quick. They forgot what Jesus said. So they stayed in the wilderness. Don't, the wilderness is not meant to be a season. The wilderness is a transition from your old season into your new season. The, the wilderness for Jesus was 40 days in between 30 years of living and three years of ministry. Jesus did, I mean, God didn't say, son, now, you've done, you've done this, you've done real good for 30 years. Boy, you ain't sin. I'm so proud of you, me and your mama. You get up here back to heaven, we're gonna have your favorite meal waiting on you. But now we need you to go hang out in the woods for a while. No, that was not his next assignment. His next assignment was three years of ministry that were gonna lead to the cross and eventually to the throne. But he had to go through the 40 days to prepare him for the three years. But the 40 days were not meant to be a season. It's meant to be a transition between the seasons. The problem is if you don't manage the transition, you end up making what is supposed to be between seasons a season. The Israelites didn't pass the test. So they had to stay there and die out. Steady feet for a second. Well, I'm getting ready. We're getting ready. I'm going to mess y'all up. Y'all all dressed up just to get messed up right here. <laughs> the Israelites. In Exodus 17, just tap somebody and say, don't forget the water. Tap, tap the other person and say, you got to get dunked. You know. For all my, I can say this because I grew up, for all my Methodist folks, dunk, not sprinkled, all right? Make y'all mad. I grew up Methodist. I was sprinkled, then I had to get dunked. Got to get dunked before you start ducking, right? The same Israelites that camped out in the wilderness. In Exodus 17, 
the Israelites find themselves out in the wilderness. Everybody say wilderness. They're out in the wilderness. And they go to Moses and say, hey, Moses, we're thirsty. Moses says, all right, hang on. Moses runs up the mountain. God, whew, the people have spoken. God, they're thirsty. God says, Moses, do you see that staff in your hand? Descend upon the mountain to the people. There you'll find a rock. Take the staff in your hand, strike the rock, and water will begin to flow from its side. Say that one more time. Boy, take the rock, the staff, hit the rock, water's going to come out. All right. Moses, come back down. All right, guys. Hey, Aaron. Aaron, where are you? Aaron, hand me my staff. Here's my staff. Hold on. Get the staff. What was I supposed to do? Oh, where? Anybody see a rock? There's a rock. Moses, all right. Takes the staff. And you know what he's thinking, right? I know what you'd be thinking. Oh, this is going to work. Moses is thinking, Lord, if this don't work, I'm going to look like the biggest fool in front of these people. Because you know they're thinking, what are you, man, we thirsty. Hey, you got to come back down with a jug of water or something. Well, you know what Moses does? Moses takes the staff. He says, bam, hits the side of the rock. What happens? Water begins to flow from the side. Fast forward to Numbers 20. Moses is mad. The people have been having some contention. I mean, they had them people acting a fool and church folk. And everything was good. We started out, everybody, we just want to get everybody safe. Now they mad. You know, you got Jethro, he mad because Barbara sat in his seat. And, you know, and then you got Edith. Edith's upset because she didn't get to sing her solo today. And we got all the church, we got all these issues in the church. Moses is upset. They say, hey, Moses. Moses said, what? On behalf of the hospitality committee. We, we have run out of drink. What are we going to do? Moses, hang on. Moses, run back up. God, I know we went through this one time before. But refresh my memory on what I'm supposed to do when we run out of drink. God says, Moses, this time, take the rod in your hand. Stand before the rock and speak to the rock. And water will begin to flow. All right. Moses, come back down. Aaron, Aaron, give me the rod. Come on, we're going back to the rock. Everybody says, oh, we know how, we know how this one. Yeah, do that thing again, Moses. That thing was good. We forgot about it. Hit that thing, man. <laughs> Moses like the Coca-Cola man that shows up. You ever been at work? Coca-Cola man shows up. He got that key. He opens it up. You see all them drinks in there. You're like. <sighs> <laughs> Moses shows up. He get that rock. He says, he's going to speak to it. And then all of a sudden, right before he's getting ready to speak to it, Hey, Moses, what? Hey, did you about to, instead of getting water, can we get some lemonade? And then here's another, hey, Moses, Moses, hey, this bread is stale. I know it said that they delivered it today, but this can't be daily bread, Moses. It's hard as a brick. And then Moses, I just feel his anger building up. And Moses, you know what? Y'all want something to drink? Here. And he hits the rock twice with the stick. And all of a sudden, Moses gets a phone call. And God says, hey, Moses. Yes, Lord. Have you seen these people? God says, Moses, you were disobedient to what I told you. Man, hold up. Hold up. God, did you? No, 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 no. God, God, God. You remember that time? You about killed two cities, God, because you were mad. I, I'm sorry, I just hit a rock. I'm sorry, I lost my cool. He says, Moses, he said, because of your disobedience and your lack of faith, you will not enter into the promised land. I'm gonna be honest with y'all. I'm glad I'm on this side of the cross. You gotta have the water. Close with this. In John 4, Jesus is on a journey. He stops by a well to get him a drink. And the Bible says there's a Samaritan woman standing there. And Jesus says, ma'am, may I have a drink? 
And she goes into her, who do you think you are? Diatribe. She says, well, I'm just a Samaritan woman and you're a Jew. What have a Jew to do with me? Who do you think you are? And you know, Jesus is like, I ain't trying to be holy. I ain't here to preach. I just want some water. And Jesus says, I just want, I just, I'm just looking for a cup. I'm not here. I'm not down playing. I'm just here. I just, can I just get a drink of water? And she keeps on. And then Jesus says, I am the living water. You drink of me, you'll never thirst again. So just tap somebody and say water. Tap another person and say water. The Bible also says that Jesus is the rock of your salvation. Jesus is the rock and in Jesus is the living water. Jesus, after three years of ministry and 33 years of walking the earth, was arrested, was beaten, was persecuted, was mocked, and he was put on a cross. It says the sun began to set. And the next day was the feast of Passover. So due to tradition, they had to hurry up and speed up the process. So they go to one thief and he says, break his legs. He breaks his legs. Speed up the process. He goes to the other thief, breaks his legs. And then he gets ready to Jesus. And he says, you know, don't break his legs. He says, go get a staff, a spear. And he orders the centurion to hit Jesus in the side with a spear. He says, take that staff in your hand and strike the rock. And it says that when the centurion stuck the spear in the side of the rock, that water began to flow out. I need you to catch this. I need you to catch this. The first time Moses needed water, God said, strike the rock and water will flow. But whenever Moses needed water from then on, God said, don't strike the rock again. Because when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified one time for all. In other words, you don't have to re-crucify Jesus in order to get more of what you need. He said, the next time you go to the rock, Moses, don't strike the rock, speak to the rock. I came to tell somebody this morning, what you need in your season of wilderness is you need some water. And the water that you need is found in the rock. And the rock that I'm talking about has a name called Jesus. And Jesus is the rock of your salvation. He's the well of your living water. And if you will just speak to the rock, then he'll give you all the water that you need. And listen, water is the one thing your body's got to have. Do you realize how much of your body consists of water? In you, in you is what you need for your wilderness. Do you realize God's people were begging Moses for something they already had? They're crying out in the wilderness, give us some water. And God is looking down saying you are the water and once you have drank from the well of Jesus you'll never thirst again just smile at your neighbor and say are you thirsty stop running from your wilderness and embrace it you have what it takes to pass the test. 
intimacy with God, the word, and the assurance. Remember what he spoke over you. This is my beloved in whom I'm well pleased. And everything my beloved needs for what I've called them to do, I've already placed inside them. Will you just lift up your hands to God as we pray? I need you to hear this. Don't be scared of the water. Don't be scared of it. Some of y'all, some of y'all, there's a lot of folks who are intimidated by the wilderness. Some of y'all are intimidated by the water. You don't want to go deeper with God because you're afraid of what that looks like. You don't want to reach out and engage God because you're afraid you're going to fail and not keep up your end of the bargain. Can I tell you this? Keep your hands lifted. We're going to close. We close. When Peter was walking on the water, he messed up. He slipped and he fell. Do you know where he fell? He fell into the water. Listen, what you think is a failure, God declares a baptism. You thought John, you thought Peter had messed up when you read that in the book of John. He just had to be baptized before he could go to the next level. Lord, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for our water experience. Thank you that we are dunked, that we are immersed, that we are submerged in that deep place, that intimate place where we encounter you. But Lord, we also thank you for the wilderness season. The season where we get set apart. Separated, but not isolated. Because we're with you. Father, use our times of wilderness to completely reform what we need to be for the next leg of our journey the next season that we enter into the next phase of what you've called us for and let us in the moments of temptation be reminded of who we are and whose we are because as long as you are God then we are your children and as long as we are your children then you are our God Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the trials. We count them all joy because it's an opportunity for us to grow closer to you so that at the end of the day, when we come out into our promised land, that you would be the one that receives all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise in Jesus' name. Put your hands together one time and give God some praise. Hallelujah. Love you. God bless you. Have a great week.